So, big cars are safer than smaller cars. Uh, if any of you are in a car accident, I hope none of you ever are. I've been in a couple and they're terrible, terrible experiences. I hope that you're driving the biggest car, heaviest car possible. You know, this is a normal finding from uh, transportation research that uh, a, be the, a good predictor of whether you are able to walk away from a car accident is the weight of your vehicle. It's not the only predictor, other things matter, but a heavy car, other things equal, better, safer. So the question naturally arises, as a matter of public policy, should we subsidize big cars? Um, well, I'm leaving aside here the environmental questions, the spillover effects from, from actual car pollution, and I just want to talk about this link between weight and safety. Um, so it would clearly be better if you're driving a heavier car, but as, again, transportation researchers repeatedly find, the big danger of you driving a big car is you're, you're making driving more dangerous for everyone else on the road. I picked a quote here from the National Highway Transportation Safety Administration. I could have picked dozens of other quotes from the literature that made the same point. Large vehicles are great news for you, the driver of the large vehicle. Your large vehicle is a threat to others. They present a greater hazard to others on the road. So my story today is that college education is a lot like a big car. It's great for you to get a college education. You will earn more. You will find that your resume gets pulled out of the pile much more quickly. People who go to high status universities, much less likely to be unemployed than people who never make it to college. But part of the way, not the only way, part of the way a college education helps you is by diluting the value of other people's diplomas. So um, this isn't just my idea. Michael Spence won a Nobel Prize for developing some, what's known as the signaling theory of education. Uh, his idea is quite simple. Employers really want to know who the good workers are and who the bad workers are, who the weaker people are and who the stronger people are. And a job interview isn't that great a way to tell who's good and who's bad by itself. Talking to people, not a great way to learn about the quality of, of potential job applicants. Um, but Spence said, boy, wouldn't, wouldn't employers be happy if there was some kind of organization out there that sort of checked out the quality of workers? If there was some organization out there that sort of ran them through a bunch of tests, that checked out their test scores, that checked to see if these people showed up on time for meetings, that checked to see if you got work done when nobody was standing right over your shoulder, if you were self-motivated, wouldn't it be great if there was some kind of organization out there in society that was really good at checking out potential worker quality? Fortunately, we created an entire set of organizations that did that, according to Michael Spence. Universities, colleges, they check out worker quality. It's not the only thing they do, but it's one thing they do. So um, this is, again, known as the signaling theory of education. In this view, education is about showing what you are already. A diploma proves that you're the kind of person who can jump through hoops. The alternative, the big alternative, is human capital theory, associated with Nobel Prize winner Gary Becker. And Becker's story, the human capital story, is that college makes you better. College gives you skills. College makes you a better worker than you would have been otherwise. So one view is college is about testing you. One view, the other view, college is about making you. Of course, real life is a bit of both. College contains elements of both probably, right? There's some human capital, some skill building, and there's some signaling, some skill showing going on when you get a diploma. Um, I only have a few minutes to talk to you, so maybe I should just yeah, make a blatant appeal to authority and tell you what my fellow economists think about this. What do they think college is and the balance between human capital and signaling? So um, the Kaufman Foundation runs a regular survey of economics bloggers from across the political spectrum, and they ask these folks um, a variety of questions. And last year, my colleague uh, at George Mason, Brian Kaplan, inserted a question into the survey. Brian's very interested in this idea of the signaling theory of education. He's actually working on a book on the topic. Um, and the survey question asked something like this. I rephrased it slightly for the slide. What is a typical U.S. college education? And the bloggers responded, the economists responded here. And as you can see, the vast majority thought that college was half or more just signaling. The value of a college degree, according to these people who are mostly sitting in classrooms with students for years and years on end, is that they're not building skills that people are using in the real world. What they're doing as professors is sorting them. 
They're looking, they're, they're looking at students for a semester at a time and deciding, this student did pretty well, yeah. They're, they go in the high bin. These students go in the middle bin. These students are in the kind of the lower bin. And they think that's the value. Not all the value, but much of the value of a college education. The sorting, not the creating. So, um, isn't there some skill building in college? Of course, uh, even those, those survey responses showed that there's at least some skill building in college. Um, economists don't look at this very directly, but fortunately for us, educational psychologists do. There's a vast element of, a uh, vast field in educational psychology that looks at this. The biggest is known as the transfer of learning literature here. Um, the transfer of learning literature actually checks to see, does abstract classroom knowledge do things that happen in classrooms actually transfer to the real world? Do be, are people who are good on tests good as workers? Does theoretical knowledge map into real life success? And um, I'm giving you two, two quotes here. I'm trying to span the, the, the views here. Um, Detterman here is the big pessimist in the field. And, uh, but we can look at the other quote here by the big optimists, Barnett and Cece. Look at this quote. Transfer is indeed a salvageable concept. This is the optimistic point of view on the transfer of learning. Uh, let, me, let me assert here that if that's the optimist's point of view, there's probably, we should have our doubts about how much human capital accumulation is really occurring in today's actually existing colleges and universities. So, um, so there is skill building and skill showing going on in college. If we could just choose to subsidize one and not the other, that would be great. It would be like being able to subsidize cars that are heavier for you, but cars that are not heavier for everyone else on the road. That would be great news if we could do that. But the skill showing part, the signaling part of education, is pure social waste. There's an argument, of course, for, for, a fuel, for subsidizing uh, the signaling ability for people who are, who, are the, who are the poorest, people who wouldn't be able to afford to show that they have quality. There's an argument for that. But aside from that, we're just fueling an arms race. The easier you make it to get into college, the weaker the value of the signal of a college diploma. So um, here's one sign that college involves signaling. There are a lot of things, people often don't know what to call this idea. When we, some people have a sense that a lot of college is wasted, a lot of education isn't about making you better. People have aphorisms they use. You hear these sayings like, Oh, I needed to get a promotion. I wanted to get a promotion, and my boss told me I needed to get a degree. They wouldn't pull my job out, they wouldn't pull my resume out of the pile until I got a degree. Oh, I just have to get my ticket punched. These are phrases people use. What's underlying these phrases? What sort of economic theory is held up in all this sort of conventional wisdom floating around? Signaling. So every time you hear somebody say this phrase, which I'm sure all of you have heard at least some point, or that the bachelor's is the new high school diploma, You've all heard those kind of lines before. That's a sign that the person implicitly believes in the signaling theory of education. Not that that's all that happens, but that's part of what happens. So um, I call this the problem of diploma pollution. Diplomas are fantastic things for you, but they create these negative side effects. It would be great if we could get the good benefits of, of a college education without as many of the side effects. It would be great if we could do that. So a lot of people say, well, let's get whole nations educated. Let's raise the K through 6 education. Let's raise the 6 through 12 education. Let's raise the higher education of developing countries, and that'll make them richer. Because according to human capital theory, people get more productive. You learn more skills. You're better as a worker if you get education. So that's the human capital story. We've run this experiment over the last few decades around the world. There was a big push by international agencies and by the, the governments in poor countries to massively raise levels of education. Each of these dots in this graph is one country. And this, the x-axis is showing you how much these countries raised their level of education between the 60s and the 90s. And every country in this sample did. Right? They all raised their education by at least somewhat. This is a big push. This is a world transforming change that occurred, the massive rise of education around the world. If the human capital theory were the, pretty much the whole story, I'd, accept there to, I'd expect there to be a pretty strong positive relationship between countries that boosted their education levels and their long-term economic growth rates. The y-axis here shows how their growth rates changed between the 60s and the 90s. Um, I wouldn't expect a perfect relationship. Relationships in economics never are. But I'd at least expect to see a plus line, 
like a, something like that. I would again assert to you that it's kind of hard to put a plus line through that. I mean, I, I'm sure you could do it. That's what you know, economists do. We torture the data to make it confess to whatever <laughs> crime we need. It's part of our, but it's been pretty hard. And, and, and I'm just showing a scatter plot up here. And um, you, you know, correlation isn't causation. I'm supposed to say that, I guess. That's part of the ritual we do in our field. Um, but people a lot more famous than me have looked at the same kind of data and come to a similar conclusion that this big push for education didn't pay off. I'm not saying these authors believed that it was all signaling. Um, and I don't think it was all signaling. But this should be a reminder that nations can massively push for higher education and get no payoff. So Lant Pritchett, in a famous article, asked the question that this is the title of the article. Where has all the education gone? Michael Spence would have an answer for that. It all went into signaling. It all went into an arms race, devaluing the credentials. So how can we decrease diploma pollution? Um, one way to do it is to reduce subsidies for the most signaling intense majors. If you're deciding where, where are we going to put our education dollar, where are we going to put Pell Grants, where are we going to put student loans, where are we going to put federal, federal aid to education, state level aid to education, and if there are two kinds of majors, ones that have a lot of human capital going on, let me assert that, let me claim that nursing, medical school, some forms of engineering, there's a lot of human capital accumulation going on there. And there are other kind of majors where people tell you, oh, you're not actually learning a skill here that you're going um, to use in the job, but you're going to learn how to learn. We're going to teach you how to think. Well, what would an educational psychologist tell you about that? An educational psychologist would point to the transfer of learning literature and say, transfer is indeed a salvageable concept. That's what they would tell you. So when choosing which kinds of education we should, we should be encouraging in this country, the kinds that involve more human capital accumulation, certainly deserve our attention. The kinds that have vague signaling stories, the kinds that have vague stories about teaching people how to think. I come to you as a history major, as an undergrad. So I was taught how to think, and I enjoyed it a lot. But I have to look at the research and say that, I, while I probably accumulated some human capital in those courses, might not have been as much as, as, my, as I would like to think. The second way to decrease diploma pollution uh, is to encourage apprenticeships and internships. If the message of the transfer of learning literature is correct, then people aren't good at transferring knowledge from vague theoretical knowledge to practical knowledge. The best way to train somebody for a job is to have them do a job. So apprenticeships is something we're familiar with. I come from a long line of pipe fitters on my father's side of the family. And there they have a long tradition of, of, of apprenticeships. Internships are another way to do this. Um, college internships, multi-year internships would be fantastic for a lot of people who are in what we call college. Um, but a problem, one difficulty with this is that recently legal barriers, regulatory barriers in particular, have made it harder to have internships. Um, some internships have been running afoul of minimum wage laws, which is quite unfortunate. Uh, it seems a little odd to me that you're allowed to pay massive amounts of money to supposedly learn job skills in college, but you're not allowed to just earn zero money doing something called an internship. So perhaps reducing those regulatory barriers would be a great way to get more people actually acquiring skills that matter. So another alternative to more pollution, closest to my research, is to try to import more high quality human capital. If we have doubts about what our colleges and universities are actually doing, if we have doubts about how much human capital is being accumulated in a lot of majors, one alternative is to just bring it in from other countries. Uh, in, in microeconomics, firms are always faced with this, we always say that firms are faced with this decision, the make or buy decision. Should this firm, should General Motors make its own tires or should it buy them from somebody else? Should the US as a country make its own computers or import them from somewhere else? Fortunately, we don't actually have to buy high quality human capital from around the world. High quality human capital would be more than happy to come here. Science, technology, engineering, mathematics majors would be more than happy to come here for free. Goodness, they'd even pay for it. So if we have our doubts about the amount of human capital being built in our colleges, there are plenty of ways to just bring it in from many other countries around the world. So, the next time you're sitting at a college graduation and you see all the mortar boards fly up in the air, I want, to ask you, I want you to ask yourself this question. And if the answer is at least a little bit, 
then you have taken the first step toward believing the signaling theory of education. Thanks. <laughs>